So uh, yeah, thanks for coming to my talk. This is a HIW, uh, and they specifically say in their call for contributions that you know half baked ideas and crazy stuff is welcome. So here's my half baked idea, and I'm hoping to you know apply some heat today and bake it a bit more. Uh, yeah, so that's why I'm here. So uh, I call this CSI Haskell, uh, and I'll explain that uh, a bit later. But in the you know extended abstract, I could cite like a paper on criminology. So I like that. Anyway. Uh, so here's the problem, right? This is a you know contrived program. You might wonder why is it not written with guards or what is it doing? But it's just it's just trying to kind of give you a, a, a list of the divisors of a number, right? And then uh, you know we have a nice function called smallest div, and it gives you the smallest divisor, right? But this is a buggy program. So this is a talk about error messages. So what happens is that if we run it on a prime number, right? It's like off by one, and it just returns the empty list, right? Um, and then, okay, so let's try running this program. And you know, I don't want to do too much demos because it's hard for the technicians. So we run this program and it says, oh, prelude head, empty list, right? And you know, you, you wrote this program, you probably remember where the head is, but you know, this error message doesn't actually tell you where in the program the head is. It might be anywhere, right? So, okay, you know, we see, oh, we were doing something here, there's the head, right? But it actually, yeah, you, know, you don't really know about it, right? So uh, we try to get some more information from GC. We can ask for the, the stack trace, and it says, oh, you know, it's this head here. Uh, this is pointer, yeah. So it says that this, this head here, right? But then the problem in this program, it's not really the head, right? It's not that we're using head that causes the error. It's really that the output that we're, you know, producing that's then consumed by head, that's doing something wrong, right? But if you read the stack trace and the error message, it, it doesn't actually mention any part of the code where the bug actually is. It just talks about, you know, the reason it produced the error and not kind of why the error came about, right? Uh, and so, yeah, in this talk, I'm gonna talk a bit about, because this is a runtime error, right? And we talk a lot about improving uh, the com compiler error messages, but you know, we also produce runtime errors. So I think we should, should work on that a bit. So. What do we do then? Yeah, so this is this head and we found that, but you know, it, it doesn't really help us in fixing this program. Okay, we can go here and see, okay, what is this doing? But you know, especially, uh, so what I also do is I do uh, automatic program repair, right? And then I use the errors to figure out what's wrong, but you know, this error doesn't really help because the problem is not in any of these functions. It's actually in the, uh, you know, the producer here, right? So that's the, that's the point, right? The error mentions the consumer of the, like the bad data, right? But you know the fault, uh, you know, because we always talk, talk about fault localization. It's actually in the producer. So we would like to improve this situation, right? We would like to talk about, you know, let's tell the user uh, what was happening right before the error. This is where the crime scene investigation happens, right? You know, someone gets murdered, they die, and then you know the in investigators come in and they think, okay, he just came home from work, he put down his coffee mug. They read the scene to try to find out what happened, right? That's why I call the CSI Haskell, right? All right, so the insight here, right? So, so how do we deal with this? Well, uh, you know, Haskell is a lazy language, right? So, so evaluation is demand-driven, right? So you don't actually produce data until right before you need it. And you know, there's a bunch of optimizations and sharing and all like that, so. But you know, kind of in principle, this is what we think about, right? So that means that kind of, when you consume data, it's usually, been produced right before, like in the, yeah, you know, for, for small programs, right? So if we kind of trace recent expressions, if we kind of look, what were you doing right before the error happened? We can figure out where the faults are, right? We don't have to actually look at the whole program. We just have to say, yeah, so yeah, someone gets murdered. You don't think about what was he doing 10 years ago. You just want to know what was he doing right before, you know, the day before, like, yeah. All right. So, uh, so here's some background. So I actually, I, I, was, I was thinking about this talk and I'm thinking about, uh, you know, Haskell program coverage. And then I asked on, you know, Reddit, I said, you know, has anyone heard about Haskell program coverage, right? And, you know, some people, like most people hadn't. So I wanted to explain a bit. Uh, so it's added by uh, Andy Gill and Colin, uh, Colin Russellman in uh, 2007. So it's been around for a while. Uh, and actually what it does is that when you compile with this HPC flag, uh, it adds a kind of a wrapper around every expression, and then when you evaluate that expression, it, it updates a tick in like an array. So it's an array that keeps track of all the expressions and how many times they're evaluated. 
And like the, the, the focus uh, here was like they wanted test coverage. They wanted to see, you know, do, do the tests hit all the test cases, right? Um, so, you know, you run the program, the runtime system, it actually has this data structure that says, oh, you know, this expression was, uh, it, it's just a big array, and every time you run something, it ticks that array, right? So uh, uh, you use some program coverage, and it's built in, right? And this is like, if you look at the paper, you know, the, the arguments for why they was, were doing this, it was that uh, it was scalable, and this is in the sense of uh, build systems, right? You just add a new flag when you compile the program, and it adds this feature, right? So you don't have to, you know, manually add a program transformation everywhere. It just kind of works. And yeah, it's easy to use. That was one of the focus uh, of the design. And it's low cost, right? So it, you know, when you run the program, it just bumps an array entry. But uh, Simon had a, a good point uh, in the in the Haskell talk, uh, state of GHC before, is that you know these it's it's low cost here, but it comes at the cost of optimizations, right? So you might want to push that tick uh, a bit later. Okay, so this is Haskell program coverage, and we see that yeah, it's ticking. It's like it's looking at when an expression is evaluated, right? So uh, our approach, uh, or my approach in this half-baked idea is, you know, let's take the HPC features and let's extend it a bit. And let's say, you know, let's track a recently evaluated. So I keep italicizing this recently. I'll, I'll explain why I do that later. Uh, so we track the recently evaluated expressions. And then uh, this is important for, for errors is that, you know, if you run a Haskell program and you trace and every single expression that got evaluated, you get a lot of output, right? Uh, and you know most of it is not really useful. So uh, here I was going to do a live demo, but then the technicians are they didn't want that. So I decided to take some pictures. So this is a file we saw earlier. Uh, a nice uh, fork of GAT is running here, and then we run this command. We remove whatever was before. We build it with this uh, HPC trace flag, and here's a magic number 250. That's just the size of the trace. So I'm just going to keep track of the recently. 250 recently most uh, evaluated expressions. And this is also like, uh, you know, one of the ideas here is, here is if you trace everything, you have to keep, you know, extending an array and you might get, uh, you run out of memory very fast, right? All right, so we, we run this and we execute it and, you know, it works. Uh, it, it compiles the file. We see the old error here, the head. We see the old trace, but now it actually has this uh, output. It says, you know, what were you doing right before we uh, run it? Okay, so. I know this is very hard to read, so I've happily, you know, highlighted and uh, increased the font. Very nice. Uh, so, and the idea here is, okay, now these parts are actually, you know, they correspond to the program. So we can actually, you know, point the user, uh, especially if you have an ID, you can say, oh, you know, it was th this is what you were doing. Like, we jump from here to here and then here. And then, uh, you know, the producer, like the, the divs function is now actually mentioned in the error message, right? So you can actually point the user to, you know, something is going wrong here. This is what I was doing right before this happened. So my, you might want to check that out, right? Uh, and I've happily, you know, this was hard to read. So this is an even more visual explanation of it, right? So uh, what happens is that, you know, this enters here and it goes through a loop, right? And you can actually detect the loop in the in the message. And we're actually, uh, you know, this is a summarization of traces is a whole research field for itself. So it's, it's hard to do well, but yeah, it, it can handle five nested loops. That's it. Uh, okay, so it runs this loop, uh, and you know we can just remove the loop. We don't care about that. That was not really what was was happening. And then you know it runs through the main, goes through the smallest div, you know, and then it enters this function, and then it goes here into the go, and then you know it runs the loop eleven times, and eventually it lands in this branch, and then it says you know you know line four twenty five to twenty six. This is the alternative that it ended up in. And this is all. You know, this is not added by me. This is all from HPC. So HPC already has everything we need here. And then, you know, it says, I took this alternative, and it's an empty list. So now we can actually figure out, oh, okay, this was the empty list that had evaluated, right? So now you know where the bad data came from. So you can probably guess that, you know, we probably need to fix the, you know, this line here. It's off by one, right? So we, that's what we need to fix, right? So, yeah, it really helps you when you're trying to automatically repair programs, you know, what was happening, right? And uh, you know, so you know, going from the motivations from HPC, uh, you know, the CSI thing is scalable, right? You just add one more flag. Uh, it's you know, it's easy to use. It's just two flags, right? So you say, you know, you have to say HPC because it, you know, that has to be there for this to work. And then you give it the size of the trace. You can decide how long you want to track. 
and then you know it's a very low overhead right so it's just you're just bumping uh so now it's a circular buffer right so you write the index of the expression and you go to the next one right so it's very easy and it should just work uh yeah and then so the future work here is like you know i want to i want to hear what you think you know this is sound reasonable does it not work and then we have to write a gsc proposal so uh i'll probably talk to you again on thursday uh write something up and see you know is this acceptable uh and then you know some some research work like you know how close are producers and consumers in practice right uh and then you know another uh, another thing we might want to do is you know might want to summarize better because you know if you have a long running server you want to be able to say uh, you know ignore the parts that you don't yeah so it's really hard to give a good error message in text for at least and then uh, same with this is like the uh, a follow up to the producers and consumers you know if we if we strictly evaluate something and then you know way later we actually run into the error right it's not going to be in the trace right? so how does that affect it uh, things are shared so we might have to have looked at it before and then we're looking at it again and we get the error and it, it ties into this you know yeah, in actual programs, are we very close? Is it very tightly coupled or, or is it very far away, right? And then, you know, if we want to do this and we're just debugging, like, can we turn this off? And there's actually some work, uh, you know, done by Marco and, and, and Pablo and, and Breitner on uh, on turning off these things. Because actually, uh, you know, if you, if you have a secure program, you can get some leakage because you're sharing things and then if you evaluate the same thing twice, you know, ah, I didn't actually get the right password because it didn't, yeah. So there's, there's work on turning off these things because, uh, you know, uh, you know, sharing in particular is very baked into the compiler, so it's hard to turn off. But we can turn it off and we can get these nice error messages. All right, that's uh, all I have. You can play with it. Uh, you can ask me questions and then I'll be around. So yeah, thank you.